Good morning, Jacksonville. How you doing? Guys, my name is Earl Granville. I spent some time in the Army National Guard as an infantryman. In my time in service, I found the power of what service and community could do. I want to back up a little bit, tell you my reason to join the military. My twin brother, Joe, came to me our senior year in high school and my thoughts of joining the military. And I got to say, my attitude, listening to punk rock, going to shows all the time, was like, dude, I don't want to do that. Working for the government? What's that going to do? No way, man. I don't want to work for the man. Just my attitude at the time. However, the incentive was a free education. See, what I took in this avenue was, what can this, what can this do for me? What can I get out of this? Moving forward, Joe and I graduated high school, had a nice summer. We landed in Fort Benning, Georgia for basic training, September 1st, 2001. You all know what happened 11 days later. And I looked right at my brother, and I said to him, Joe, what did you get me into? I didn't join the military to go to war. Sounds ridiculous, right? Because I was making it about me. This wasn't in my blueprint. I just joined for college. Well, there's no turning back now. I had to grow up real quick. Joe and I then went to Bosnia. Nice deployment, 2002, 2003. If you guys aren't familiar with the Bosnian conflict, read the book, Love Thy Neighbor by Peter Maas, and watch the movie, In the Land of Blood and Honey. Get an idea of why we had NATO forces in Bosnia. At the time we were there, there was no fighting at all. Nice peacekeeping mission. Came home from that deployment in 2003. When we got home, being our National Guard, I went forward and got that education, the whole reason why I joined the military. When we got a warning order two semesters in for Iraq, but it was a volunteer mission for those who were in Bosnia. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to stay back. If I don't have to go, so be it. I'll stay home, partying up in college still. Joe, on the other hand, he was going to go. So it made me think, maybe I should put my big boy pants on and join him over there, because God forbid if anything happened. And ladies and gentlemen, that was the best decision I ever made. What do I mean by that? I was making the military all about me. What can I get out of this? Going to Iraq, the adversity we were faced with over there, while I was an NCO, a very young NCO, I realized this isn't about me. It's about us. Being a part of something bigger than myself. And the big picture of wearing that uniform, and the men and women around me, and that camaraderie. I played sports in high school. However, this is a little different. There's a whole different realm, combat boots and a rifle, and the women, men and women, and looking after each other. I saw the big picture of not just service to myself, but those around me. I loved the military so much after that deployment. Joe and I both re-upped our contracts, and we came home in 2006. I got two more semesters in at Lackawanna College, got my associate's degree. Moving forward, we got another warning order, another volunteer mission. This one is Afghanistan. So I raised my hand right away. Joe, on the other hand, he decided to stay back. He's now married, and him and his wife want to start a family. And Joe begged me to stay home because he was staying home. He's like, sorry, dude, I'm cutting this cord. Now, on this deployment in Afghanistan, I was promoted to staff sergeant. And our job over there, we're part of the Providence Reconstru Provincial Reconstruction Team, PRT for short. And our job over there as a security force for the PRT was escorting civil fair officers and U.S. civilian engineers as they had meetings with local government and village elders helping rebuild infrastructure in Afghanistan that the Taliban was destroying. Pretty cut and dry mission. And everybody we would escort would sit in the backseat of our vehicles, except for one individual. This gentleman was named Major Scott Haggerty. And Major Haggerty just liked to be in charge of the vehicle he was in. I saw on this four-day mission, Major Haggerty was going to be in my vehicle. I knew Major Haggerty was going to take my seat. So be it. Tell you what, Major Haggerty, instead of me sitting in the passenger seat, how would I be your gunner? 
And I put my gunner, my friend Craig Rain, as a passenger in another vehicle. It was a four-day mission in eastern Afghanistan, a little town called Zormat. We're looking at a future site to build a school. And while we're out there leaving on that final day, we had to take a different route back to Fob Zormont to fuel our vehicles before we head to our home of Fob Gardet. This route we were unfamiliar with, but I won't get too deep into why we took this route. It just seemed a little safer, though, from what we were traveling in all that week. But nobody was familiar with this route. So our first day out there, nice green vegetation, beautiful landscape. It was the first time seeing not just the nitty and gritty of what the rest of Afghanistan we were seeing in the Paktia province. And I remember coming over the headset in the gunner's hatch. Man, who's watering their grass in Afghanistan? This is beautiful. The next thing I remember, I saw nothing but black. You know when you clog your ears or you put your head underwater? It's like that faint noise you hear. That was the best way to describe what I was hearing at the time. And I felt the momentum. And in my mind, I'm saying to myself, what is going on right now? When I came to, opened my eyes. Big, beautiful sky. It's like 2.30 in the afternoon over there. Why am I looking at the sky? Oh, geez, I'm on the ground. My feet are backwards, and I'm full of blood. To the left of me, the Humvee is completely destroyed. We just hit a roadside bomb. All I wanted to do in that moment was assess the situation and figure out what's going on. Are we getting ambushed? Is anybody else hurt? I heard my buddy Joe Vodi yell, get him in a body bag. Okay, people have been killed. Is it us? Is it them? Are we under attack right now? My doc came to me, Air Force Tech Sergeant Eric Jones. And Doc Jones started working on my wounds immediately. I said, Doc, how's everybody else doing? They're doing fine. They're doing good. We're going to get you out of here. Doc put a pressure dressing on my wounds, put a tourniquet on, and they put me on a litter, and they carried me over to an MRAP for cover. And when they carried me over, they walked me right past two body bags. And with the body armor around it, I knew exactly who it was. It was my buddy, Major Scott Haggerty of Stillwater, Oklahoma, who took my seat that day, which is why I'm still here, and Specialist Derek Holland of Wingap, Pennsylvania, who was driving the vehicle. Derek was only 20 years old. Called in the nine line, medevac chopper came, put myself and an Afghan governor who was in the backseat of our vehicle on the medevac chopper. And as that Black Hawk took off, I just thought to myself, where's my life going now? We got the Bagram Air Base. I went under for surgery immediately. The next thing I remember, I'm waking up in Germany to a doctor saying they're going to amputate my left leg. And after a few surgeries there, Finally get back stateside, Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And this is going to be my home for a while, figuring out this new life. My third day at Walter Reed, my immediate family gets a green light to come down. And one by one, they come visit me in the ICU. First my mom, first my dad, one of my siblings, and eventually there was Joe. And I could say, ladies and gentlemen, you got to remember, I'm feeling pretty good. Remember, I got this second chance at life because where Major Haggerty decided to take my seat that day. So I'm cracking jokes. I'm being a goofball. I'm just having a good time. Joe at some point said to me throughout the day, I should have just gone with you. Gone with me? You could have been killed. But that's just how Joe is. My mentality, though, I had to move forward. I got this second chance at life. What are we going to do with this? And my time at Walter Reed, I was learning that, learning how to walk again, learning how to snowboard once again with a special prosthetic leg in Vail, Colorado, learning new activities like disabled versions of ice hockey. I wasn't going to let this adversity define who I am. More tragedy comes, though. A week before Christmas in 2010, I'm getting ready for a black tie event in Pennsylvania. I get out of the shower. I put my prosthetic on in my suit pants and a t-shirt before I get fully dressed. I'm in front of the mirror doing my hair. All of a sudden the phone rings. I let it go to voicemail. Finish doing my hair, wash the hair gel out. 
I look at my phone. I see it's my mom. I listen to the voicemail. She said to call her immediately. She sounds distressed. So I give her a ring. And she says my name so ever somber. I say, Mom, what's going on? What's the matter? While on active duty, my twin brother, Staff Sergeant Joe Grayville, commits suicide. Worst day of my life, ladies and gentlemen. How do I get this second chance at life and have my own twin brother take his away? And my mentality went right back to making it all about me, feeling sorry for myself, playing the victim, thinking the world owes me everything. Let me ask you something. Where's playing a victim get you in life? Nowhere. You're absolutely right. That year was a big blur. Just living in the past like Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Just reminding everybody from my military service. But the turnaround of my life, I started physically challenging myself, and I didn't want this to define who I am. My adversities does not have to define me. And I started working for charities. I started pushing myself more physically, doing stuff that made my brother proud of what I was doing. And joining organizations like Operation Enduring Warrior, I saw the big picture. This isn't about me. Just like that Iraq deployment, I realized it's about us. Being a part of a community, being a part of something bigger than ourselves. And with Operation Enduring Warrior, the Oscar Mike Foundation, my friends in the Give team who are in the audience, I realized I don't need a uniform to serve my country. I can do it right here in my backyard. Because that's what it's about, the power of what community can do. Now remember, ladies and gentlemen, I believe there's three Ps we need in our lives as human beings, military or not. We all need these three Ps. You must have a purpose. You have to have a passion. And you must be part of something bigger than yourself. My three Ps, my purpose. I'm a public speaker discussing my healthy ways of battle adversity. My passion, physical fitness and traveling are very important to my life. And I feel like it fills up my soul. Part of something bigger than myself. These charities I'm a part of. And the recipe to find those three Ps, ladies and gentlemen, a good attitude. Because that dysfunctional veteran, Uncle Rico attitude I was having in my life wasn't going to get me anywhere. Comfort zone. You must take a leap out to find what you're looking for in your life. And number three, community. We find that here today. I found that in the GORA community. It's more than just a patch at the end, ladies and gentlemen. It's those relationships you build, just like an OEW, just like an Oscar Mike, just like the Give team. It's more than just that medal at the finish line. It's all of us being a part of something bigger than ourselves, achieving it together. Because those relationships you build on those heavy days when we have to tackle adversity, I found out we don't have to tackle it alone. The weight of adversity as a community, we all carry it together. And I got something to show you about that right here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cindy the Cinderblock. And what Cindy represents, my friends in the Give team, they know exactly what this is. And what Cindy represents is that heavy mental adversity that we all face as human beings. Guilt, stress, depression, anxiety. We look at small businesses during COVID, the adversity they had to face. The idea of Cindy, when we take her out, I'll start off with this, but after a while, she gets a little heavy. But luckily, I have a team with me, so I don't have to carry this alone. I'll pass this off to maybe my good buddy, Jonathan Lopez, over there. And Johnny will carry Cindy for a bit. Or maybe Johnny will carry the brick, and I'll be right next to him carrying the chain. The idea, ladies and gentlemen, nobody carries this by themselves. Because that's the same up in here. When we're overcoming obstacles, when we're battling adversity, as a community... Being a part of something, we understand those relationships we build. We have people now to lean onto. Because it's not about me, it's not about you. What I learned in that Iraq deployment and what I learned from Operation During Warrior, it's about us. You guys tracking? We cannot control the things that happen in our lives, ladies and gentlemen, but we always have the ability 
and freedom to react to them the right way. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Earl Granville. Thank you so much, guys, for having me. Appreciate it.